We're here with Alicia Bay Laurel. Alicia has actually written a book from the inside, Living on the Earth, about experiences, being, living in communes, in the communal lifestyle. And I feel it's such a wonderful opportunity to have you share with us that experience from the inside. And the, the first thing I'm just dying to ask, because we all think of communes and utopia, the hippie dream and all that. Um, what's the magic there? What's the magic? Did you feel magic when you were there? And what was the source of that? The magic was living with nature. Mm. There was no cement between us and nature. There was no glass between us and the air and the stars. And for me, that was magical. That was, that was heady potion. We're here with Peter Richardson, who runs the American Studies program at San Francisco State and is an author who has written about various aspects of the 60s, including Grateful Dead, etc. Welcome and thank you for coming down and talking with us. It's my pleasure. So, of course, we're looking for that value that we can find from the culture of the 60s, the movement, the counterculture, etc. Do you see a lasting, resonating impact today in culture and society in general? I really do. I mean, I think that there's two ways to think about it. One is that the Summer of Love is a kind of culmination of things that were happening in the 50s and 60s. And, and then I think the second part of the story is what's happened since then and the, the effects that the Summer of Love has had on not just the region, the city and the region, but also American culture more broadly. And I, I don't really think you can understand the second half of the 20th century American history, that is, without understanding the counterculture. Mm, that impactful, that important. Right, and I, and I, you know, if you, if, and you can't understand the, the counterculture without understanding what's ha what was happening here in San Francisco during that time. So, so I, I, I do think it's been very important and I think you can draw a kind of straight line between what was happening in the summer of 1967 and what people are saying now about uh, so-called sometimes disparagingly as so-called uh, San Francisco values. And I think those hinge um, largely on a kind of um, effort during the 1950s and 60s to expand our, our political and our artistic and our sexual freedoms. And I think if I had to sum it up quickly, it, it might focus on those three things. What about our cultural life today would not be if not for the counterculture of the 60s. It's probably almost easier to do the opposite. I, th I think al almost everything changed because of the counterculture. Uh, our sense of well-being, our sense of spirituality, uh, how we get high, how we think about everyday life, how we think about love, how we think about our spiritual practices. I mean, the counterculture had a major inflection point in modern life. I would love for you to elaborate on any or all of those. You put an impressive list of things yeah. up on a slide during the presentation. Let's go a little bit deeper. I mean, what about love? I think one of the things that I love is, is a, a book comes out. Everybody should read this book called Groovy Science. And, and these guys really broke it down by case and, and showed us how much of the ways in which we live everyday lives have changed. So when it comes to love, I mean both physical love and the emotional bonds we have with each other. I mean, people in the 1960s in the counterculture really interrogated what kind of loves were there? And how did they mean? And what was the relationship between sexual intimacy and emotional intimacy? And, and people thought about those things publicly. And I think that was the breakthrough that everybody kind of been feeling those things and worrying about those things. But suddenly we were able to talk out loud about them. Did you see a lot of love on the communes? Sure, yeah. And if you have a good compatible group of people, um, which is pretty essential, um, you, you most like a, any relationship over time, it can really deepen. If you want it to deepen, it can do it. And a lot of communal relationships do. What's, what's the magic in the commune? 
the magic? Well, part of it is just fun of uh, being around other like-minded people all the time. I mean, that's pretty nice. Uh, we spend a lot of our time with people we don't know, we don't have much feeling for. Um, and there you're really in an environment of people who think like you do, at least ideally. Uh, you also, there's a real feel that you're going to make a difference. I mean, that, that's kind of the underlying drive, I think. Uh, there are different ways you might make that difference, but today a lot of communities are environmental in nature. They see a planet as just rolling off the edge of the cliff, and this is maybe a way we can attack that. Um, in, inherently, communal living of any kind is a step in that direction because of the efficiencies of communal living itself. If you have, well, Twin Oaks community in Virginia, uh, about 100 people, and I think they have around 12 or 15 cars, that's enough, that's all you need. Um, so instead of having 100 cars, they've got a few. I mean, where's the environmental gain there? There's a big environmental gain. Um, and this, th th that just is repeated throughout. You don't need all of this stuff that we have. You don't need the energy consumption that we have. You can live perfectly satisfactory life on a lower level. And by, in communal living, you do. It's just part of the animal. You, you, you bring up so many points to, and threads to pick up on. I'm, I'm fascinated. I didn't realize that you lived on a kibbutz in Israel for a couple of years. I'd I like to tie that together with the, the hippie commune movement. And, well, and I, I definitely do. And I don't believe I said that formally. But I feel that one of the big differences between the beats and the hippies was the hippies, when you came down to it, those the real hippies were communal. Yeah. They weren't here just to get stoned. Communalists. Yeah, we just to get stoned. Yesterday. Communalists. Mm -hmm. like, why, I, I, I should, anyway, uh, let me stop a minute. Yeah, communalists, because I, and, and with the death of the hippie, have you already covered the, the diggers, by the way? We, diggers get brought up uh, all over the place, yes, of course. Okay, well, I was there with Peter Berg and Peter Coyote, uh, Peter, Peter Cohen, who became uh, Peter Coyote. Okay. I think he's around. I don't know if he came to the conference, room, but anyway. Yeah, we haven't seen him around here, but he is around, and we do plan to go up to Sebastopol and talk to him, too. And uh, uh, anyway, Peter Coyote, Peter Berg, and the diggers came out after that song, Come to San Francisco, wear some flowers in your hair. You'll meet some friendly people there. And we realized, well, who's that? I guess that's us. And out of it came the... Uh, uh, the uh, long before food not bombs came the feeding every day mm -hmm. so, and every day in the panhandle. Yeah. It was still kind of sexist. Women, mostly, mostly women doing the cooking. But it, was, but, but it was a bold move of rebellion to feed people, to nurture people. It, it, that's just the, the irony that I love so much, that it took bold rebellion to nurture human life. Yeah, wow. And, and you can look at, uh, if you wanted to figure, uh, the, a lot of the, there's diggers, diggers.org, I think, and uh, you'll see that a lot of the Digger papers so online, uh, brother, I forget his name, put it online, because we had the Digger papers. They were like the man Hugh Manifestos. Uh, uh, we said Manifestos, this is the sexist thing that we're still struggling with. Hugh Manifestos. And, uh, but Digger women were definitely, there wouldn't have been Diggers without the Digger women for sure. Mm, okay. and, and so you had, so when we talk about the posters, when we talk about the shows at the Lavalon and so on, remember there's all people were being being fed, were being fed in the Panhandle, and also you saw saw the book of the free store. The free store, yeah. The free store, and it started as a garage on on Page Street called the Free Frame of Reference. <laughs> and somebody somebody built a, a big picture frame, and you step through it to get in. There's that concept of the hippie utopia. Do you, do, do you see some utopia out there in the communes? Well, utopia is what you make it if you're really doing what you want in life. I mean, how much better do you get than that? Um, utopia is a funny word in our society. It's thrown around in funny ways, I think. Uh, it means for a lot of people kind of pie in the sky. It's unrealistic. It's a dream, maybe, and it's done by silly people who don't get reality. And that, to me, is not what utopianism is at all. Utopianism, to me, is imagining something better. It's dreaming, if you will, it's, it's vision. And communal living almost inherently is, has that. How about the other side of that San Francisco vibe coin, the ideology here uh, of the values of peace and love, compassion, sharing, diggers, free spirit, communal living, um, how uh, psychedelics, 
yeah. uh, consciousness expansion, etc. How do those ideas seem to go over with the current generation over there? Any affinity for those values? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think particularly uh, this kind of culture of openness like we were talking about before, right? A culture of acceptance, of inclusion, of diversity, right? That's something that, you know, in France, where I am now, where the, most of the especially young people embrace this idea, right? It's, it's, it's older people who are struggling with it. It's not young people, right? Uh, come out of the closet and let us know who you really are so we can accept and embrace and love you anyway. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly, wonderful. right? And, that, the, and uh, you know, thank God for that, you know, that there's young people who are on board with that message because it's the politicians who are so worrying, right? And kind of, cult just as in this country, kind of cultivating this kind of fear but I don't think most young people, at least the ones I encounter at universities, are not falling for it, right? And they can really relate to it uh, in San Francisco or New York, right? Like when, I, when we teach this kind of stuff, it resonates clearly. What are these San Francisco values you're, you're referring to in there? Uh, tolerance, you know, sympathy, good mm. temper, mm. Uh, but mostly these freedoms, you know? And, you know, you can trace it in a number of different ways. You can look at these uh, court decisions that were coming down in San Francisco in the 50s and 60s. I mean, you could look at it culturally, the spread of um, organic food markets, um, recycling centers and other environmental efforts, um, uh, rock festivals. There really were no rock festivals before the Summer of Love. And, and just the, the spread of those ideas from this region um, to, to the rest of America. It's, a, it's sort of our gift in many ways. Not, not to say that it was all bright side stuff, but there were a lot of things um, that came out of the summer of love and, and that period more generally that I think have real value and that are appreciated that way. It's beautiful. And what about all the peace and love thing and the diggers free spirit and taking care of each other and free food in the park and living communally? Well, that was really important, and one of, one of the talks we heard today, or yesterday, on the Back to the Land movement was really a, a direct outgrowth of, of that. And we're talking about millions of Americans that did it. That was a national movement, but it had a very interesting sort of local chapter. And, uh, and that's worth understanding, too, and the kinds of effects that that has had on our culture and the way people have thought about uh, community, for example. Community is so important here in San Francisco because, um, as I say, you know, it wasn't a very competitive, um, aspirational culture. It was always a matter of people getting together and, and supporting each other. And when they did that, good things happened. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but sometimes it fell apart or there were real setbacks as well. But the, the, the basic, um, the underlying values, let's say, of the beats and the hippies, I think, can still be seen in, in San Francisco today and still need to be fought for. I mean, you know, that, that's the thing that I mentioned earlier. There are no lasting victories. You're always going back and making sure that, mm. that, um, that some of these accomplishments can be sustained. Well, let's make a lasting victory out of it and proclaim ourselves you know, believers that we should take care of each other mm -hmm. and that they were onto something then and that a summer of love can be a, a, a forever of love. If there's value in their actions and their insights and their practices, let's embrace it. Let's, let's learn from history and, and apply it today. And it seems like a consistent factor in that culture was just that peace and love. We just want peace. We just want to love each other. We, we want things to be better than they are. We want things to be more equitable and more yeah. just than they are. We want to feel we're all brothers and sisters. And how could any of those be a bad thing, really? <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is now, people feel like you're not allowed to yearn for things mm -hmm. sometimes. And here's a moment in history when there's millions, I mean, first hundreds and thousands and then millions of people who really are yearning for the world to be a better place and their and them and their own individual selves to be healed in a better way and uh, for the society to work better mm -hmm. for on behalf of everyone and you know i think they maybe that history gives us permission mm -hmm. to think about what what are we yearning yeah. for how, so how many of us are yearning for those things now right and wow. then grown exponentially <laughs> yeah and then how do we turn the yearning into action yeah. And effect solutions. and solutions right yeah. and 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 how do we keep asking the questions better that's why i think like 
I don't worry as much about whether the counterculture was a success or failure, because I think what's more important is it's a model for how to keep trying to think harder about things that are dilemmas, right? They're not easy. There aren't easy solutions to these issues. So how do we keep thinking harder and try to ask better questions, I think is part of the project that, that the Summer of Love um, joined. I mean, they joined a history of people doing that before them and that we can uh, participate in that lineage of trying to think harder about the world. I love it. And it's a great punctuation mark, too. How do we think harder and ask better questions? Yeah. Let's keep doing that. Right? Exactly. Right. It's this lyric that I hear in a seven-second song, clenched fists, black eyes. And he right. says, we're aiming for a different goal, succeeding where the hippies failed. Right. But one thing's sure, and you can bet, we'll be more than a drugged-out threat. They were a straight-edge band. In your opinion and what you've observed, read, and studied, were the hippies just a drugged-out threat? No. <laughs> the, Good, thanks. <laughs> the hippies were not just a drugged out threat. Yeah. And I uh and that's part of the point of, of the paper I gave yesterday was to talk about how part of what inspires punks, what inspired them as children, was the example set by hippie use and by that generation. Mm -hmm. And then there was a kind of frustration that's built a little bit on caricature on of of the hippies kind of failing, giving up, kind of abandoning the cause and then punks feeling like right we have to revitalize this we have to restart this so like one punk i interviewed the other day said we have to kick the carcass out of the way and then get our thing going right but it wasn't like a complete rejection yeah. right of like killing the hippies the way you're often told right? it, it sounds like just a, a an accepting of a baton and running with it yeah exactly well and, but, and, and a, a lack of willingness to acknowledge that that's what they were doing right that's the strange thing is the total lack of willingness to acknowledge it because particularly here in san francisco there were a lot of people who were originally punks uh, sorry originally hippies who become punks right so there's there's all of these punks are kind of baby boomers right and they ra range in age kind of dramatically from people born in the 40s to people born in the early 60s. But the ones who were born in the 40s, they're hippies first, right? And then they become some of the most important intellectuals and architects of the early punk scene. So there's a clear through line from the counterculture to punk. It's just not acknowledged by most of them because most of them were so disgusted, they claim. Right, with, with the failure of hippies and of that generation. Yeah. One thing I always noticed was they talk about marijuana being a gateway drug. And to me, it seemed like it was more a gateway drug because it, it caused you to cross that line into the black market, the underground. The, you're now doing something illegal. You're, you're choosing to break the law. And so now you've, you have a kindred spirit there with you when you're both breaking the law. You're both now in that underground. Yeah, that's a really good insight. I, I think especially in the 1960s when maybe not so bad here in Northern California, but in some places to get caught with a very small amount of marijuana could put you into jail for years. And, and so you were living in a place where you had to trust each other, right? Dealer, Snitches and all Dealers that. had to trust the people were buying from and vice versa. You had to trust each other. If you were going to get high in somebody's house, what did that mean? And it's a great phrase. Abby Hoffman of the 60s said, we're all living in an illegal nation. And that was a boundary point. Were you in that world or not in that world? Were you somebody who would cause someone to get arrested? Or were you someone who'd be, hey, you want to hit? And that was a solidarity that was really profound, in part because of the persecutorial nature of the state. And you, you always knew they weren't a cop if they took a hit. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> right. And it right. tests people. Yeah. <laughs>